Welcome back. This is Literary Goa once again and we have a very interesting book, the cover of which you probably saw in some bookshops. It's uh, published nationally and it's on Goa, Becoming Goan. The author is Michel Mendonca Bambawale and uh, sh thank you Michel for coming here today, nice to have you. I, I speedily read through your book and I liked it. It's just out. It's not yet formally released, but uh, sure. it should be. Tell us how you got to writing your book. Thank you so much, Frederick, for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, this is my first book and this is my first TV interview. Uh, so I think I decided to write the book because I felt um, I was, during the pandemic, thinking a lot about moving and identity and many things like that. I think there was a lot of time and I was trying to process my emotions about living in a pandemic. And um, so I had a lot of observations about Seoli in particular and about Goa in general because, you know, everyone was moving to Goa. It was a safe place. Everyone wanted to be here. Um, so uh, people wanted my insider kind of view about how I felt. Uh, since even though I never lived here full time, I inherited a house, I used to come and go, I had extended my house, so I had a strong connection. But wait, 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 we are running ahead of the story. So let me, <laughs> let me interrupt you here. So I want to start off by saying that Michelle actually is a Pune Goan. Uh, her roots are in Shioli. Uh, she has been doing up a house there in the year 2020. That's how the book starts. She talks about uh, during the pandemic 2021, right? 21? 2020. 2020. During the pandemic itself, when there was a short break after all those uh, lengthy uh, lockdowns, she and her full family moved down to Shioli. And uh, that's where the start of a book is. A pretty brave thing to do. Uh, Shioli, as you know, is this uh, village in Goa, large village with four or five different hamlets in it. And uh, now the center of a lot of change. One thing that struck me about the book, Michelle, and which I liked a lot is that the book uh, has, it almost works at three different levels. On the one hand, it's your story of returning home. Uh, on the other hand, it is a cry of angst of the changes going on in Goa because with so many people coming in and wanting to settle here and things like that. And on the third hand, you're also kind of uh, guiding, you know, telling people about uh, what is it about Goa that you like and maybe giving us a hint of what we need to preserve the creativity, the traditions and so many things. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I knew it was at many levels. I wanted it to be light, but obviously it had, you know, some deeper emotions that I was feeling. Um, there are many things that I didn't know as an expat Goan who comes, you know, for holidays and even when you come here for a short time, there are many things you don't know. You sort of have those stereotypes of, you know, what you see, the Bollywood and the social media, which is the hippie or the bohemian or the party and everybody's having a good time. But when you live in the village, you realize how religious people are, how conservative people are, how connected to the land they are the number of festivals, the number of, you know, things around foods and around planting and around agriculture, which you don't see at all. How difficult life in Goa can be in a village? It's very difficult. So I don't know where this Susega, you know, party stereotype comes because all I do is some wall has fallen, one tree has fallen, some dog has fought with somebody else, some the internet is not working, something is happening. So every day I wake up thinking, now what's going to happen? There's no time. Never a dull moment. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> but but Michelle, what I liked is that uh, your book uh, is very nicely written. Uh, it, it has a very conversational style about it. It's a very light read. You can go through it very fast and uh, enjoy it while reading it. It's also well researched. Like I was, you know, the reviewer in me was searching desperately to find some mistakes. <laughs> some mistakes. I always do it. It's subconscious. Like no, not because of you, but uh, I was trying to find some mistakes, but I couldn't. Uh, give us an introduction. Phew. Phew. I was most nervous about no, that. No, no, no. Give us an introduction. I'm still searching. I might find <laughs> them by the time I write the review. But I'm just joking. Give us an introduction to your book. Tell us what are the chapters it contains so that the reader who has not yet, uh, the listener who has not yet read it would know what what's in your book exactly. Okay. 
so I think this whole thing about identity and Goan identity and who's a Goan and who's an outsider and bigger issues I think in the world of identity and of history. You know, what is history, who writes history, whose point of view is seen in history. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to write like my version of um, whatever I experienced in Goa. So that was the whole reason for writing it. I had started blogging. First I thought, okay, I'll just put my blogs together. But obviously that's not a book. It's far more complicated than that. Um, so before actually giving contemporary history, I just wanted to start with the pandemic and you know what I felt, what I saw, what I learned. I learned a lot. Like I didn't know so many religious things, the amount of Ladinias, the amount of Vesper, the um, Sai bin going from home to home, the number of feasts that happen. I, I didn't know that. I mean, because I think growing up in Pune, it was very sort of anglicized, well as here it's a lot of... Um, it's community you know, life. Yes, very community driven, people are always sort of uh, working together, that whole uh, Samudai concept, all these things, you know, when you don't live here, you come in and out, you don't experience them. When you live here, you realize all these things happen. So I was very curious about it. Same with like wedding traditions and things, which you don't know, we had, you know, there's a mass and a reception and there's a toast and whatever. But here there's a roast, there was that um, feeding the beggars, there were so many other traditions that went with it. Um, even around, um, <clears throat> you know, All Souls Day, All Saints Day, all these things are very big here and they're celebrated and people are very uh, devoted about this. So I started thinking about the identity and what it meant. And I learned a lot of traditions that I didn't know about. And a lot of Goans like me who are expat Goans uh, don't know either because I think I met a lot of people who are the Sorpatel and Sanna's cardio bodio and then they're out. They don't know yeah. anything. It's superficial. They don't it's deal. Very, yeah. it's very. But they have a strong, like Interest. they are Goan, yeah. they know, yeah. but they don't understand the language at all and they don't know anything. Like for me, I mean, even I started making coconut oil, so many things that, you know, were part of village life. Um, and then mangoes, like this whole thing about your mango trees and when the flowers come, then the cashew and the feni and the cashew flowers and when the urak season starts. So there were so many things that I learned from living here. In the short time, in the, you learned a very fast, quick learner. I am, because I think what happened to me is I've lived as an expat. So you have to go into a culture and very quickly sort of sort yourself out. You have to figure out, you know, how to survive. And you you learn a bit of the traditions, the culture. that. So I, I try to learn a lot more. I think if you've lived here your whole life, like so many people, you won't go on so many mocks. You won't be curious. But I was very curious to know. And the more I learned, I felt, okay, let me write this down. Because not just for myself, many people like me wouldn't know who are Goans living in different places, mm. but many different people who are living in Goa, they don't know either. I mean, many people say like, what is this Navina or, you know, what happens on Good Friday? Why is there Good Friday? And so many small things that you sort yeah. of take for granted. So that's why I felt I needed to somehow record it. Yeah. So that is one chapter, of course, as far as the traditions. What's so special about Goa anyway? And also, what's so special about Goans anyway? These are two two special chapters. Okay, but uh, I like... What's so special about Goa anyway goes a little bit... Uh, it brings in the whole yeah. uh, tourism history about how this whole beach party stereotype and thing started, which it sort of started in my lifetime of my coming here. So I've seen like Kalangut, what it was to what it mm. is now. So I think I wanted to, it's like a more like a 50 year history of yeah. tourism and mass tourism and things like that. And then you have three chapters dealing with Choli. Yes. Okay, so so I think they're, they're extremely detailed and because Choli lacks a book, of course, uh, our friend, the sacristan, late Sebastian de Cruz wrote many books, but they were more mm -hmm. like booklets and all. Like, you know, but here you've taken a whole lot of information and packed it very nicely here. Uh, so, there is one chapter on finding Shioli, stories and legends. Uh, Shioli then, your idyllic holidays in the 70s, 80s. And Shioli now, angsty urban rural purgatory. <laughs> nice, nice chapter titles. But in these three chapters, between page 55 and almost 112, 
you have covered surely in so much detail. I, I found so many things I, I couldn't find anything that you had missed out. I worked very hard because I spoke to many, there were many different angles, like for me and many people, you know, Beethoven statue and you know, um, no, you don't know Beethoven statue, you know, mm -hmm. St. Anthony Church, you know, Remo and that's it. Yeah. Nobody knows anything more about Surely. And there were so many more things. So I looked, I went through all of um, Sebastian de Cruz's, you know, the people he mentions, the places, even chronicles when the uh, bridge came, he chronicles like the shops and everything. I don't want to go into that level yeah. of detail. I wanted to make it more conversational. Um, then, I mean, so many things, Hilario Mangos, football came to Goa from, uh, through Sioli. I mean, so many small stories that sort of got woven into the bigger story. So, um, you're, you, you are obviously a storyteller that comes from your work in advertising or what? Maybe, I don't know. I mean, I've worked in advertising, I've worked in journalism. Uh, I guess I've always liked writing, so it has to do with storytelling. But it's it's important that you you got you captured all this uh, you know scattered information and brought it to one place. So while you are telling you know about the charms of Sholi, you're also not romanticizing it, and you're talking about the changes going on there. Elaborate. So I think many people have moved, and there is a lot of development, but there's no planning. So we have no sewage system and all our wells, as you know, and in all villages, they're all polluted because soap pits are close to the wells. The <coughs> so you have sewage tankers that come, you have polluted wells. The garbage has now started being collected, but bottles are not picked up. Plastic is on the sides of the road. There are, there's one, I think there's one, I must get a photo and show you one. There's one very beautiful house just around the corner. And in the two years, like I would take photos when I was walking my dog and say if I had money, I'd buy this, I'd buy this. It was just like, a, you know, romantic. Yeah. <coughs> it's gone. And there are some 11 or 12 villas, like three or four stories high, each with a pool. There's just no space. Opposite that, some more villas and across that, some more villas. And already, like already from about October, November, the the traffic is just you can't leave your house and you're just doing your normal life you know going to work or going to get your groceries but you can't go so i think the unplanned development affects goans which they don't you know they haven't they're not able to say like you know we, this has to stop what is the planning what are the options so i think that was difficult for me to see that you just have no control it's just like the landscape is changing uh, while you were young, you you all regularly, like most uh, outside Goans, came for holidays annually. That was, I guess, in the month of May. Uh, to tell us something about your holidays and then about the Pune Goans. I have one whole chapter on that, uh, Frederick. You'll have to leave. Read. So it was, we would come to our house. You'd come on a bus. You would be tired. You'd reach Mapsa. It was an overnight bus, and you take another bus to Seoli. Then you were there. There were only buses, there was no other way. I mean, taxis were, but it, they were very expensive. We didn't really go anywhere. Um, most of the time we'd spend in Seoli. <coughs> in the 70s, my grandfather was in um, Home for the Aged in St. Joseph. So we would visit him there. Uh, we had relatives in Asagao, in Porvari, and in Panjim. So we would come. Panjim was very exciting. It was the big city, and you know, it was l very pretty. The Mandovi, we'd go to swim in Donapal. So it was very a different, relaxed kind of uh, life that we really enjoyed. Many expat Goans, including Bombay Goans, have this story. But uh, we don't know much about the Pune Goans for some reason. I, I also know you're part of this Memories from Pune. Facebook page. So tell us about uh, the Pune Goans as a community. So I think the Pune Goans, I mean, I didn't know this. Again, I started researching it now after I got into this thing of, you know, trying to understand mm -hmm. where you come from and the history. So the church, which is the city church, the Church of the Immaculate Conception, was apparently set up for the Portuguese and for the Goan soldiers who came to fight. On land given by the Marathas. Yeah, by the Peshwa. Peshwa. Yeah. So I think that whole community, we lived very close to the church. We were, you know, parishioners of that parish. There was a Pune Goan Institute. 
uh, where we would go for dances, uh, you know, those Christmas dance, carnival. My father and my grandfather would play bridge there in the evenings. Um, when we were kids, there would be tambola and movie nights and things. And that was, you know, your understanding of uh, Goan identity. The other thing was making Christmas sweets. I mean, that was a very community thing. We'd all make Christmas sweets together and, you know, give each other, go for midnight mass, um, have coffee after that and go to the Christmas dance. That was a lot of, you know, what the Pune Goans would do. We all lived around the city church and the St. Xavier's church. Uh, most of us, many of us went to uh, St. Anne's, which is the convent of Jesus and Mary, and across the road uh, is the Jesuit St. Vincent School. Um, so that was the Pune I grew up in. That has changed as well. Um, and I think maybe another motivation for writing the book was, you know, if you look at Sioli now in the future, you won't know what it was. Um, the same thing, if you look at the Puna that I grew up in, it looks totally different now. I mean, there's some of the houses are still there, but the people have changed, the people have moved. Um, it's, a, it's very different. Fascinating what you say, because I mean, while there is a sense of loss among all of us about the past, we, uh, the expat Goan, my belief is that expat Goans have also played a big role in, 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 in preserving our memories in kind of uh, telling us what is important in having strong views about this, maybe because absence makes a heart grow fonder. Sure. Like sure. the Bombay Goans sure. have played a huge role in, in, sure. in sure. you know, in, in creating the Tiat, in creating Konkani magazines, promoting it, whatever. But uh, of course, one has heard a lot about uh, the schools there in particular, Loyola's and, uh, and St. Vincent. Vincent's. And because the Jesuits were common, the Goa Puna province, we shared yeah, priests yeah, and all that. Yeah. Your my principals, uncle, your yeah. principals my would come to our schools yeah, and all that. Yeah, yeah. And your mom also was the principal or headmistress of St. Anne's. Tell us about her. She was her. first uh, the principal of St. Felix, which is the okay. convent of Jesus and Mary. Uh, they have three convents in Pune. St. Anne's is the oldest, the greatest, and the, you know, it was the biggest one. I think it's more than 200 years old. They have another one, St. Joseph's, which is across the road from Loyola, where the Jesuits have a school. And there was St. Felix, uh, which is right on the river. Uh, so she got that school till the 10th standard. And she was like the first, sort of set it up. And she was the first uh, principal for the 10th standard. They had it as a primary school originally. She never wanted to be in the same school as her daughters. So uh, the Two of you all, two of you all. So as soon as I finished school, the nuns uh, brought her to St. I Abs. see. Uh, what I liked is the chapter titles are very catchy and uh, very insightful also. The many Shiolis and Goas today. Tell us about that. So I think uh, I always remember it's like the Goa is like the, what are those? The parable of the elephant and the blind man. Yeah. Ten blind Not men. parable, it's a story. Yeah. It's a story of the... Yeah, the six so blind men. Everybody has yeah. some completely different view of Goa. And there uh, are many Goas, you're saying? Yes. I mean, I you living here know yeah. that. For me, it, you, I sort of discovered it. So there are many people who live very different lives. There's some who live a very, you know, hippie life. There's some who live a very... Um, fancy life. There's some who live a very good life. And I don't think... They, 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 they don't meet, they, they don't, don't meet. meet. So this in this chapter, it's here that you talk about the different kind of uh, people settling in Goa. It's in this chapter. You dis, uh, you describe about 10, 15 different, different uh, types categories. of people, categories. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. I thought like you described them in great detail. Uh, I tried to give you a flavor like, you know, what they think about and what their interests are and that kind of thing. And I realized that, you know, the questions I would get, somebody didn't know what a po there was, somebody yeah. didn't know what pao or poe was. So people living here without having those insights, I was, I was, that's why, I mean, it seems very basic for somebody like you who's lived here your whole yeah. life. Yeah. But many things, you know, you, I discovered and I felt, you know, I should document. I thought it was funny. You mentioned somewhere about Russians setting up businesses, mostly for other Russians. So I have been <laughs> not allowed in. I mean, they don't let you in to that. So, so okay. I mean, that's it's. I have been a stereotypical and extremist and created caricatures. Yeah. I mean, there are many Russians married to Goan women yeah. who live in Avado and things like that. Yeah. But I, to make a point, I've created a lot yeah. of these caricatures. 
then uh, the, uh, you have a chapter on uh, Portuguese property law. The chapter's title is The Devil is in the Details of Portuguese Property Law. So tell us. That was a. Uh, so I think anyone who has ancestral property yeah. and you have to transfer it into your name, it is a very complicated process. And I mean, there are so many caveats and there's so many, you know, if there's a will and the will is probated, you're fine. Mostly there's not. So, I mean, my father had a will, but it was made in Pune, and for some reason I still had to go through the whole inventory succession uh, sort of procedure. So I, so I understood it intimately because I had to do it myself. But there was my father, there was my sister and me, it was pretty simple. The same on my mother's side. Small I family, to, uh, small. Yeah. On my mother's side, I had to understand it. And living here, I mean, in the two, three years, everyone, the Goans who came to visit me who were family or friends, they would be, you know, getting paperwork together, getting no objections, trying to transfer the name from some forefathers' generation to theirs. And it was very complicated. It is very complicated. And to me, to see how difficult it is, but at the same time to see how fast land was being sold and houses were being bought, it was very sort of, you know, I didn't know how it was happening. I couldn't figure out how it was happening. Very interesting, very interesting point. And I think, uh, you know, we, we neglect these issues because they are so complicated or we only realize how important they are when it hits us in that exactly. sense. But, but we, we need to discuss. I have a lot of examples um, because, you know, so many people have donated their houses to religious orders and to orphanages and I mean I've again used Yoli as an example and I've used different examples that I know of um, but I mean there are I could write one more book just on the anomalies <laughs> of the property law and what everyone goes through. Then uh, another very sharply uh, critical essay from the title itself you'll get a feel and then the knot was sold and Asagam became Gurgaon. <laughs> Asagam became Gurgaon. Okay. But, but I mean, behind the laugh, it's a serious issue. It is. It is. So, like, uh, yeah. But of course, we, we won't uh, give any plot spoilers <laughs> and uh, make people go in and buy the book, which is widely available. And uh, yeah, it also you have chapters on learning Goan celebrations and traditions. Uh, we will not recommend this chapter for local people because it is like Goa 101 for people who don't yeah, know yeah, Goa. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If you live here, you don't know. But, but I liked your last chapter, Finding Local, Finding My Go-To Places, which is a very contemporary kind of listing of what's happening in Goa. Particularly with uh, someone might accuse you. I mean, it's, it's okay. There's no problem with it uh, because you have to be somewhere of having a slightly North Goa slant because that's where you're 100%, from. 100%. Yeah. 100%. But it does a fine job of covering North Goa, what's happening. Thank you. And uh, many places which, you know, I, I, I marked on my to-do list mentally. But uh, also uh, juggling the joys and challenges of managing a house in Goa. That also was like a lot of work because uh, people just assume if you're in yeah. Goa, you're lying on a beach, yeah. you're, you know, having a good time, you're sipping a cocktail. There's no idea how much work goes into managing. When you're on holiday and when you're managing, staying here, it's totally different. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> And then uh, finding people to actually do the work. Like I think now before Christmas, everybody's painting their house and polishing their doors. It's very difficult to find someone. When you come in for a few days, I think those workmen come to yeah. you and go. But when you live here, it's a very different world. I mean, the monitor lizards, the squirrels, the snakes, the frogs. Which you've described with a lot of, <laughs> lot of detail. Yeah. Yeah. So the monkeys. They have been very destructive and I think, I mean, that's another environmental issue they say that yeah. we have gone into their habitat and so they are multiplying. And, but they've destroyed a lot of tiles on my roof. You worked very hard uh, to put together this book because uh, you would often say that I'm busy, I'm getting a lot of queries and all. What was the toughest part, uh, writing it or getting it published or it's, it's published by Penguin, so, so that's a big brand. But uh, maybe the queries from the editor? Sure. 
I think it was all of the above. The first was a lot of self-doubt about, you know, can, am I a writer? Can I write a whole book? How will, mm. how will I write a book? It should be conversational. And I think as a journalist, your writing is far more very factual and very chronological. You know, this happened and this happened. Yeah. Well, as when you're writing a book, you have to tell a story. So it has to be far more creative. You have to create a lot of characters and conversation, especially bits where, you know, there was history and there were things like that. I had to really, and even the property law chapter, I had to give many more anecdotes and many more conversations and create a lot of characters. So the writing was difficult. Then researching, the researching was very so. Researching was like I had a lot of observations and a lot of things that I thought I knew, and then I would talk to people. I would look online, and then I went to um, like Goa today. It's not so. I went to the library. central library. Then a few things. I went to the Xavier Center. Um, but it's not like, you know, very academic or very well yeah. researched. I did look up a lot of sources, but I didn't want to make it very heavy. Um, then publishing the book is, um, I realized that the best way was to get a literary agent. Um, but writing to a literary agent, m the feedback I got from many was that it was very personal. And so, um, you know, who are you and why should we tell your story? Well, as a memoir, some more celebrities and things like that. Yeah. So I didn't know how to change it because this was like my style and this is what I wanted to say. Um, then I went to Jacaranda, Jaipriya Vasudevan and she was like, no, no, Michelle, this is your story. You must, everyone I meet has moved to Goa. What's happening in Goa? Because everyone from Bangalore, Chennai, Pune, Delhi, Bombay, they had moved to Goa in the pandemic and many were not moving away. So I think everybody was curious about what was happening in Goa and I had the story sort of as an insider. Yeah. Because in between I thought, should I fictionalize it? Should I make it fiction? How do you know? You tell the story um, in the best way and get a publisher. Uh, so she said, no, no, Michelle, it has heft. It has a story to tell. So she said, don't worry, just keep writing. But I had a lot of self-doubt and every once in a while I would give up for some time and then something would happen. I would be triggered by one more house coming down and some more villas coming. Um, so I would go back to writing. Um, and then I think for me traditional publishing was the best route because I didn't have the confidence as a writer. I knew I needed an editor to help me. And mm -hmm. the editors at Penguin were very helpful. Um, because they don't know me, nor do they know Goa. So I had to explain yeah. things in a lot more detail. They didn't know a lot of things that you and I, you know, it's like okay. part of our vocabulary. So it was a good uh, learning for me. And like I had a whole chapter on Haruki, my dog. I had another whole chapter on okay. Puna, my whole Puna story. Okay. Um, but there was just no place yes. because it was a contemporary story about Goa today. So it, that was great learning because the discipline that comes in discipline. from yeah. you have to just let go of you know yeah. thousands of words yeah. and days of work. Um, then you and other people suggested illustrations, um, so I thought that was very useful. So mm. um, I, my friend in Pune, she, I was very happy with the illustrations. Then of course Alexi helped me a lot with a lot of the Sioli history, the Sioli intel, the contacts in yeah. Sioli. Um, and though his style is very particular, it was not working for the whole book. He predates you by four or five decades, having exactly, returned from Bombay, exactly, from exactly. Bombay, and, and being a master at it, issues, and becoming a master, issues. mastering absolutely, it, mastering absolutely. it. Absolutely. But he was very helpful, and I wanted to have, and everyone surely they say Alexi, so I w I knows. wanted to have his uh, caricatures for the surely chapter. And he was also, no, no, Michelle, you should get uh, this girl with the job for the other caricature, uh, illustrations yeah. looking at her work. Um, but I was very happy that he, you know, those are very typical and those are his and that's what we have for this Yogi chapter. Thanks a ton, Michelle. Uh, we have spoken so much and there's so much more we can say, but just the clock is reminding us we are out of time. <laughs> okay, okay. The time fi flies very fast. It's an interesting book. I really liked it. All the very best, and I hope this will not be. This is your first; it won't be your last. I but don't know uh, if I survive this book. No, you will definitely. Why not? All the very best. Thank you so much, Patrick. Thank you.